Welcome. Hey, it's Yvette with the Appointed Encounter. Welcome to the third episode. We are in the book of John chapter number four. I want to say thank you so much again for continuing to follow along as we meet the Lord in different ways along this Samaritan trek to Galilee. Um, we are just in a bunch of stuff. We've covered two verses only in three episodes, but there is just like so much that we can get out of the word of God. And so just as a quick recap, if you remember, if you haven't listened in prior to this third episode, go back to the podcast at uh, theappointedencounter.com or podcasts dot theappointedencounter.com and you can follow along and begin on the journey. Again, we're only at verse number three, so it's not a lot for you to catch up on. And just so that you know, the episodes are less than 15 minutes, so it's real easy for you to catch up. But let's just do a quick recap. In the first verse of John chapter four, we encounter Jesus being producing a permanent change in us. You know, and then in verse number two, we find that baptism was done by the disciples and not Jesus himself. Why was that? It was because Jesus is our scapegoat. We encounter Jesus as our sins are transferred to him and he carries them away as our scapegoat. And so today what we want to do is try and move on. We're going to get on into verse three and touch in verse four, see how quickly we can get this done. Maybe I can get through the two verses within the 15 minutes, but let's go ahead and begin and see what this un appointment uncovers for us. So in John chapter four, verse three, we read, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee. So y'all going to know that in my studies, I am always asking a lot of who, what, when, where, and why. Who is this? What is that? When was this done? Why was it done? Where is this place? Why is this so important? So again, we need to know the significance of why Jesus left Judea and departed again into Galilee. Why is this so significant that we know that He's just going home, right? He lived in Galilee. He was in Judea. You would expect him to have to go home eventually, right? Well, what can we learn about that? What we have to do is look back again to John chapter 2. And in John chapter 2, verse 13, we read, And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. So we learn that Jesus has been in Jerusalem because the Passover has just taken place. So again, this is nothing unusual in that day and time. Passover is over, so he's going home. No brainer, right? But the question comes to mind, again, why is this important for us to know that he's going back to Galilee? What is it about this time frame? And so, of course, I don't know. I can't see it clearly in the scriptures. And so I say, Lord, what is it? What are you showing us here? And he directs me to really more so look at the Passover and the following festivals that were coming. So we understand that after Passover, there was the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which was another seven days after the Passover festival. Then we have the countdown to Pentecost and the Feast of Weeks are taking place or the first fruits, the Feast of First Fruits. There's a wave offering that is done of the first two leavened loaves from the new wheat harvest. So here we have this offering taking place of a harvest that has, has, has been reaped but Jesus is not presenting a harvest. Hmm. So what we're looking at is that there needs to be a harvest before he gets back. 
Remember Luke 10 and 2 says, Therefore he said unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. But where is this harvest? Well, John 4 and 4 says, he must needs go through Samaria. We're not going to probably get through all of this, but again, I'm going to try to, but let's do this because we need to connect this harvest from uh, that we're reading about in chapter 3, in verse 3, I'm sorry, along with verse 4. There's a whole lot, but we need to learn more about this. And so what we need to do first is take a look at Samaria. We need to learn a little bit about Samaria to understand uh, the significance of Samaria. And um, one thing that I think that was interesting to me, I don't know about you, but I find this his interesting. I'm a history buff and I kind of look at the geography of things and everything. Um, did you know that the territory that we read about in the Bible called Samaria, that that territory that is Samaria, not just the city of Samaria, but the entire territory of Samaria is now called the West Bank in Israel today. And so for those of you wondering what day and time we are in, in case this is like another time, 50 years down the road, we're looking at today being March 20th, 2020. And so today in, in the, the country of Israel, it is the West Bank, um, I want to be politically correct somewhat, but in, in, in that area, it is the West Bank. Now you can kind of understand the turmoil that goes on there because there's always been turmoil going on in that area. It was Samaria and now it is the West Bank. And so there has always been animosity between the Jews and the people who inhabit that land territorially. And so... What we're going to do is take a look at a few passages of, of scripture to learn a little bit more about how Israel captured that territory. Uh, we'll be in First and Second Kings to understand the background of the area, but we do need to know that originally this land was captured by Joshua and uh, the children of Israel after coming out of uh, the, the wilderness period. And this land was captured from the Canaanites and assigned to the tribe of Joseph. It was allotted to Ephraim and the western half of Manasseh. If you remember correctly in uh, your Bible studies, Manasseh was so large, half of them settled on the eastern side of the Jordan. The other half settled on the western side of the Jordan. And this is the territory that they were given. So um, along with Ephraim, um, remember before Moses died, he gave Gad, Reuben, and half of Manasseh land on the eastern side of the Jordan River. And so now we're kind of getting things in place, or I hope you do. Um, we're getting a few things in place of where we are looking at and how we came into this territory. And so when we begin to look at 1 Kings chapter 11, so again, we're going to go pretty quickly. We're eight minutes in. 1 Kings chapter 11, we learn how Solomon had begun begun to worship the gods of his wives and he was not keeping the commandments of the Lord. And so God told him that he would take all but one tribe from him, but it would not happen during his reign. It would happen during his son's reign. And so we know that this all happened. And after, uh, this took place there was, well, during all of this time that this is taking place, that Solomon is worshiping other gods, we have a a person by the name of Jeroboam, who was a mighty man of valor within um, Solomon's uh, mighty men and, and, and his army. And Solomon made him a ruler over the house of Joseph. And so if he's a ruler over the house of Joseph, he's a ruler over this territory that had been assigned to, to, uh, Manasseh and to Ephraim, the Samaritan territory. So there was a point where he was leaving Jerusalem to go into this area and he was met by the prophet Ahijah who prophesied to him the renting of the kingdom and 
that Jeroboam would reign over 10 tribes. Well, as a result of this, Solomon didn't want that to happen and he sought to kill Jeroboam. Jeroboam then fled to Egypt until the death of Solomon. And so now we come into 1 Kings chapter 12 and Solomon's son Rehoboam is now reigning in Solomon's stead. And the advisors of Solomon have advised, have told Rehoboam to be a servant to the people. He was to be a servant or a worshiper of God. He was to be able to lead them as a David would. Um, he was to worship the Lord and to minister and be the ambassador of God before the people. He was called and he was sent by God for accomplishing some type of service, such as to raise up the tribes of Israel. And so that's what the the advisors that were underneath Solomon, who advised Solomon, were now advising Rehoboam. And so we remember this story and we know it because remember Rehoboam forsook the council because he went and talked to his boys and they said, yeah, you don't want to tell them that you tell them that we're going to make it worse and that you're going to make it worse than what they had underneath your father. And so Rehoboam, um, did not listen. Verse eight of second Kings chapter 12, we read that, but he forsake the counsel of the old men, which they had given him and consulted with the young men that were grown up with him and which stood before him. So he just left it entirely. He abandoned it. He didn't want to do anything to it. He renounced that habit. He renounced that way of life. Understand, this is really important for us to understand, but he forsook the counsel of the old men. Forsook meaning to give up or renounce a habit or a way of life. Rehoboam renounced the way of life, a life dedicated to the worship uh, in the service of the Lord. He didn't want to be a, a servant. He didn't want to be an ambassador. He chose to be served. And as a result of this, the kingdom split. It divided as it had been prophesied. And though Rehoboam thought to fight Jeroboam to keep the kingdom united, the prophet Shemaiah spoke to him to say that he was not going to uh, go up to fight Jeroboam. And so now Jeroboam controls 10 of the tribes and builds up Shechem in Mount Ephraim and thinks that the kingdom will unite if they have to go up to Jerusalem for the feast. Remember, there are feasts that take place that have to be celebrated in Jerusalem. Those feasts are Passover, Shavuot, and the Shukot. When the people have to go up and they have to go to the temple to sacrifice and worship. Well, Jeroboam, now that he is in place and he is king over the 10 tribes, he decides that I can't have the people do this. I know that God said that I was going to be king over 10 tribes, but I do not want the people to turn their hearts back to Rehoboam because they go up to Jerusalem and have to worship at the temple. And so now we have a problem where someone is upset that the heart of the people are going to turn back to God. The heart of the people are going to be forgiven. How many times do we see these types of things happening in, in, in the church that we don't want to, to have someone go over there because you may like them better than me. And that's where Jeroboam was. He wasn't looking more so at, at the fact that God had placed him and that God has his perfect plan and that he was being used as a part of the plan, but he looked at it as I'm king and I don't want them to go up. And so what does he do? He makes two golden calves and he places one in Bethel and one in Dan. And, and, and he says that the people have to worship there. Ah, oh, come on, y'all. We got golden calves again. Didn't that happen in the wilderness and didn't that cause a problem? But what he did, and this is where we have to be careful, people of God. Please understand, we need to be careful because Jeroboam did something to make it more convenient. But he also did a twist to things. 
And so when we are making things more convenient, this is what he told the people. If you're not paying attention to what is being said to you, if you're not paying attention to every little detail, you won't realize what is really being said. He made worship convenient for the people, saying it was too much to go up to Jerusalem. So we'll see the mindset still in the people today later in, in in John chapter four, that very same mindset that Jeroboam put in the people way back after, after Solomon had died, that, that it's too inconvenient to go up to Jerusalem to worship there. Let's just do it here. It is the same mindset that we find in John chapter four, as we will see as we go further along into this study. And so now we have the king causing the people of Israel to sin. Verse 30 of that same chapter in in first Kings chapter number 12, we read, and this thing became a sin for the people went to worship before the one, even unto Dan. So he then made high places for them to worship. He made priests of the lowest of people. If you remember correctly in the word of God, God said that the priests were only to be of the Levites. Only the Levites could be priests and the high priests could only be from the line of Aaron. But uh, Jeroboam goes and um, tells anybody, whoever wants to be a priest, you can be a priest. And he didn't care what your life was like. It is important that we know what our life is like and that we live a righteous and a holy life before the people. And I'm not saying that we're not going to have our faults because most certainly we do have our own faults and we die daily to our sins. But we have to recognize that there are times that we have to live a standard and we have to set an example. And it doesn't matter whether you are the pastor, the bishop, the apostle, or whatever your title may be, or if you're just a pew warmer, we have, we are all priests. We are a royal priesthood and we have to live before the people a holy and a righteous life that the people may know so that God can choose even you. It doesn't matter what your stature is. He will make you great before the people. He will exalt you if you humble yourself before God. Amen. And so we want to know that he did this. And then the next thing that he did, y'all, and I know this is a lot and you're not seeing how this is, is relating to this story, but this is the background of what happened in that land. What he did next was he made a feast in the eighth month on the 15th day that was just like the feast in Jerusalem and all offered upon the altar in Bethel. He burnt incest there and all of this was devised. It was devised in his own heart. And so he's now starting to take things that were done in, in, in the temple and the feast and the festivals that were ordained by God. And now he's starting to make his own things. And so in Kings chapter 16, first Kings 16, 24, it says, and he bought the hill Samaria of Shamir for two talents of silver and he built on the hill and called the name of the city which he built after the name of Shamir the owner of the hill Samaria this was King Omri Ahab's father this is the establishment of Samaria and now becomes the capital of the kingdom of Israel Samaria the city. And now we're starting to see how Samaria even came along. And so we move on to second Kings chapter 17. I am past my time. I'm going to go until about a half hour with this. Samaria is besieged three years by the Assyrian. Again, second Kings chapter 17, we will learn that Samaria is besieged by um, the Assyrians for three years and then it's finally captured and Israel is carried away into Assyria placing them in Hala, in Habor, and in the cities of the Medes. That you can find in verse 6. And so what the Assyrian king then does is he then brings people from Babylon, from Cuthau, from Ava, 
from Hamath and from Sepharvim to possess Samaria, the region. And these are the people that dwelt in the cities. And when these people did not fear the Lord, because they couldn't figure out what to do, the Lord um, and they didn't reverence him. He sent lions, the Lord our God, sent lions because they were not respecting the land and that this was God's land and that this was land that he had given to the children of Israel. And so the Lord sent lions to slay some of them. And so they appealed to the king of Assyria in verse 26 and said, listen, we don't even know what to do. The nations that you have removed from this place and we don't know the God of their land. Remember, these are people who worship whoever and whatever, whatever was going to get them what they needed. And so he says, you've sent us here and we don't know the gods and we don't know what they want from us and how we're supposed to worship them. And so they're starting to hit their God is slaying us and send lions and everything because we don't know how to worship him. What do we do? And so what the king of Assyria said was, okay, this is what I'm going to do. And so he took a priest from out of one of the lands that he sent and he brought them in. But so get it. So people look at us and they think they know how to tell us to serve God. They think they know how to tell us how to live right. But when you come over and try and do it, they don't know how to please God. They don't know, they, these people didn't know how to please the God of Israel. It's not surprising though, this, the, you know, because there are displaced people. They, they, they were placed here. You're not going to know the kingdom of Israel. They're not going to, and what they didn't even realize is that the kingdom of Israel wasn't even serving the God of Israel. They weren't doing it proper anyway. So now we've got strangers in the land that are being slain. And so in Lamentations, we remember that, you know, that, that, that it is of the Lord's mercy that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. The displaced people of the kingdom of Israel were not properly worshiping either. Their idolatry caused them to be taken captive, but the strangers in the land were slain. See, God doesn't play when it comes to worshiping him. It does. He doesn't play when it comes to the way he has instructed us to do things. That's why we need to always make sure that we are in line with the Lord and God will take us out of a situation to keep us from from being consumed by his anger to keep us from being consumed. He is a merciful and a just God. And so they're not even in the land. They weren't worshiping right. The children of Israel were not even worshiping right. And they themselves should have been consumed, but God didn't allow that to happen. Ah, that's our God. He made a promise to Abraham and he said to Abraham that I'm going to bless you. He says that this land is going to belong to your seed and he's going to keep that promise. He's going to clear out things. He's going to make sure that things go the way he wants them to. He's going to keep his promise to his children. He said to Abraham that I gave you this land. I give you this land for your seed. And though they're not here right now, they shall return. So now we have this priest that comes in to begin to teach the people who have been placed in the land how to worship God. And so he comes in and instead they begin to learn how to get some semblance of worshiping the Lord. And they began to fear the Lord and they made themselves, again, still priests. They're still making priests of the lowest of the people and causing them to serve. So nothing still has changed because you're still not doing it according to the word of God. You're not doing it according to the law that God had given to Moses. So nothing has really changed. Although I give you an idea of how to do it, if I haven't been instructed right, and we know they weren't instructed right because they weren't the ones who were there in the land anyway, because uh, Jeroboam had already changed the style of worship. And so now we find that still, even with a priest who was an Israelite, things haven't changed. 
and, and, and after the return of Israel, um, of the people of God, so they've been captured by the Assyrians, and then remember the Babylonians then took over, and then the Medes and the Persians, and God promised that the people of God would return, that Israel would return to Israel. And so the children of Israel will return to the land, I want to say. And they began to return to the land. And there was Zerubbabel who was there. And these people who are in Samaria want to come up and help Zerubbabel build the temple. And so they came and they asked him in Ezra chapter 4, hey, we want to help you. Can we help you? And he's like, nope. I ain't letting you help me. I, you, you can't help me. And then they, remember, went to the king of Persia and put a stop to the work. And we know about all of this, you know, that, that Cyrus had done this. And God had to really intervene on that. Um, but they just didn't want to work. They worked against the children of Israel, and, and, and if I can't have it my way, then there's not going to be a way at all. So although they kind of sought to help out and sought the God of Israel, they didn't still want to make him their God. They still wanted to do things their way. They didn't understand that there have to be clean hands. There have to be pure hands. And so, you know, they really didn't have the mindset of a Ruth, Ruth who was a, a Moabite. And so she wasn't of the people of Israel. But yet when she came into the land, she didn't come into the land and continue to want to serve the gods that she had. No, Ruth said to her mother-in-law, entreat me not to leave thee or to, to go from thee, he says, or from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. And thy people shall be my people, and thy God, my God. And so she submitted to the God of Israel. She, she made up in her mind that I'm going to serve this God and I'm going to do it the way he instructs it to be done so that I can, can be in, in, in fellowship and so that I can be a part of this, so that I can walk in this, so that I can receive the blessings, so that I can be part of the kingdom, so that my life doesn't perish, so that I'm not lost, so that I can have, because I see that this God is a provider. I see that this God takes care of his people. There may be times that there are difficult times, but there is a peace and a joy that they have in still and in, in them still. And so these people who come to Zerubbabel don't want to do it the way God wants them to do. They still want to live their own way, but somehow, some way, just in little ways, okay, I'll give God some of my attention. You know, it's those people who like come to church on Sunday and they just come, but they don't want to go through everything. They don't want to go through the trials and the tribulations. They don't want to go through the work. They just want to receive the blessings. But sometimes, just sometimes, there's a little bit more. There's a life to live. You can't just live your life any old kind of way. You go to work every day, you come in on time, or you should, trust me, I'm a supervisor, so I know. You come to work every day and, and, and you do what your boss says. Well, what about the sovereign king, the sovereign God that we serve who is omnipotent and he does what he has to do and he takes care of his children and he makes sure that we have, he's bread when we're hungry, he's water when we're thirsty, he is there, he is our lily in the valley, he gives us hope, he is our peace, even in these trying times that we have here today, March 20th in 2020 with this coronavirus, the COVID-19 virus that is going around these days, there is a peace that God will give us. There is protection that God will give us, but we have to make sure that we are doing it according to the word of God. And so even after coming in back into the land, there are people still dwelling there that don't want to do things. And so still nothing has changed. Their mindset hasn't changed. 
even after seeing how for 70 years there are people who were put out of the land because they didn't do what their God told them. What makes you think that you can live any old kind of way if his own people can? And so now we have these people who have been transplanted to the land, taught to worship Jehovah, and but allowed to continue in their idolatry. The region of territory between Judah and Galilee at this time that Jesus is there is now a three-day journey. It's only a three-day journey for Jesus to get from from Judea to Galilee, but he has to go through this territory where these people are still in idolatry and they still think that it's okay for me to worship here. I don't have to go up to Jerusalem for the Passover. That means if Jesus was there for the Passover, those people hadn't come up for the Passover. They still think it's okay to worship. It's not okay to do it the way you want to. And so, but Jesus saw a need there. He saw that I need to go through Samaria. It's a three day journey. Most of the time, Israel went around Samaria. There was such hatred for the people of Samaria that the Israelites went all the way around. If they went through Samaria, it would only have been a three-day journey to get to Galilee. However, they took a five-day route just because they didn't like the people. How many of us take the long way around? because we don't want to go through that. And then we actually will pull out of scripture that we're trying to shun evil. We'll pull out something that we're trying to avoid that we don't want to be associated with that. But we have our God, the Lord God Almighty. We have our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who saw that there was a need and I must needs go through Samaria because there is a people and there's a shortcut there that I can take, but this shortcut is not a shortcut because if you remember, ah, oh my God, my God, my God. When we look further in the scripture, we remember that Jesus stayed two extra days. He stayed two extra days in Samaria because the people came out to him. So it was still a five day journey for him. So it's not about how long it takes. It is about Jesus seeing a need. It is about us encountering Jesus and understanding that where I think it may be a shortcut and where I think that this route is better for me to take, that there sometimes are pauses in our journey to, to, to get to a, a destination. There are pauses that stop us along the way that take us an extra two days because there's a must needs moment. We have a must needs moment that Jesus knew was there in Samaria. I can go this route. I know that everybody's going to talk about me, but if I go the other way, there are people who are seeking to kill me. There are people who are after my life and my purpose is not done. Jesus's purpose was not done. He still had a Calvary, but there were many people over the next couple of years that he would need to encounter. And so I I can't go the long route and allow people to talk to me and distract me and discourage me and to tear me down and to try and kill me. So let me take this shorter route that just makes more sense. Although I'm going to have to encounter people that really don't live right. Where is it along your journey? That instead of you going the way that everybody else goes because they say we don't need to go that way, that Jesus is encountering you and he's got an appointed moment for you right now to take this journey. It's not that your journey is going to be shortened. It's still going to be that five day trek, but there is a harvest that needs to be reaped there in that Samaria. There is a Samaritan town for you. There is a place that you are supposed to be going through and you don't want to go through it because we don't go that way. 
We don't do it that way. We're not to be around those people. But I'll tell you, there is an encounter that is on that way that God wants you to have with people. He needs you to go reap a harvest there. He needs you to go tell somebody that there is a God that loves them. Listen to me, my friend. There is, we are in very trying times right now. We are very, very tried. We are looking at situations where there is sickness and disease going around. There are shortages of food and water. There are, I, I work in a bank. People are coming in. They are very nervous about the money, their monies. People are losing their jobs. Are you going the route that God will have you to take? I know that this is a territory that we're not familiar with. I know it is a time that we never thought we would ever experience ever in life. But God is taking us on this journey right now, not just so that we can encounter him, but that others can encounter him through us, that we can be the peace in the midst of their storm, that we can provide for them, that we can be his hands and his feet. There are people that need to know that God loves them, that God sent his son to die for them. But are you willing to take the shortcut? Are you willing to go through the must needs places that no one else is willing to go? Are you willing to hit the Samaria area when people said we don't talk to them we don't have anything to do with them guess what Jesus does Jesus died for them he would that none should perish but that all would come unto repentance are you his hands and feet are you his mouthpiece we are all priests and I know it was a long journey to get here in what I said to you, but you need to understand that there is a history that is behind that place that you don't want to go. There is a history to that people and there is things that they don't necessarily understand why we do it. They just do it because this is how it's always been done. And we've got to go there so that we can break traditions and customs and religion off of them so that we can break those things and help them to know that there is a God here. There is a God in the United States. There is a God in your little town. There is a God in where Wherever you are living, whatever country it is, there is a God in heaven, a God that loves you, a God that does not want to see you lost, a God that doesn't want to see you die before your time. He has purpose for your life. But people of God, we've got to get out there. We've got to take that journey even into the places that we didn't think that we should go because Jesus said, that it is a must needs moment. And so along this journey, this encounter that has taken place in verses three and four, it's not about us, the people of God encountering Jesus, but it is about the encounter in that must needs place that he will have us go so that we can reap a harvest before the feast of weeks come before the first fruits is offered. There's a people, and this is your must needs encounter. They have a need to meet the savior. And the only way that they're gonna meet him is through you. I wanna thank you for listening. I know this was a longer episode than we have had, but it is necessary, especially in this time that we are experiencing, that we understand that it is a must needs moment. There are people lost. There are people suffering. There are people without that we have to be there in their must needs moment to introduce them to a God who loves them. So thank you for listening. I pray that all is well with you. I want you to like and share this episode. Please subscribe 
And if you have any questions, if you want to know who this God is, who is coming your way, because there's a must needs moment, reach out to me at Yvette at theappointedencounter.com. I'm more than happy to touch base with you. Again, it is Yvette at theappointedencounter.com. You can spell Yvette, Y-V-E-T-T-E, at the at sign or the ampersand, the at sign, I'm sorry, Yvette, Y-V-E-T-T-E, at theappointedencounter.com. Be blessed, people of God. Be blessed in all. I thank you. I love you, and until next time.